All right, good evening, folks. Thanks for coming out to this Gravity Fest. Um, so, okay, gravity. The uh, oldest force in nature, the most familiar force, the one which keeps us with our feet on the ground, and yet the most mysterious force. Gravity is about deep space, deep time. It's about our deepest roots, our widest perspective. It's about creation, really. And people have always thought about creation. Here, this is a print of a South African creation myth. And the myth says that there, once they, there were young girls dancing around a fire, and one of the girls picked up some embers, threw them in the air, and the hot coal became the stars, and the white ashes became the Milky Way galaxy. That's a creation story. And here you have two small terracotta figures from Hamangia. Hamangia is a region in Romania which was flourishing 7,000 years ago. And these little figures show that 7,000 years ago, they're the oldest recorded figures which show human thinking, human reflection. So these big questions which we ask today, and which we call gravity, they're human questions. We've always asked those questions. And deep down, I think that humanity is trying to find its place in the universe. And that's a continuous story. And the sky, we've projected, we've projected these biggest questions on, often on the sky. The sky has been some sort of canvas to orient ourselves in this big, big universe. And as you know, 400 years ago, after thousands of years of thinking, the game sort of changed. Because the Dutch, they invented the telescope. Smart guys, these Dutch. <laughs> but then, there was the Italian guy, Galileo, who was even smarter, and said, I'm going to use this telescope to look at the sky. And what he saw was truly surprising. Galileo saw that the moon, which people thought was just round, was full of craters. That was a surprise. And then he turned his telescope to Jupiter, and he, and he saw that Jupiter has many moons, as if Jupiter was some sort of mini solar system on its own. But you know what was the biggest surprise? The biggest surprise lied in a small detail. Galileo also pointed his telescope to the planet Venus. And he saw that Venus had phases, phases just like the moon has phases. And that little detail was the key inside which proved Copernicus right. Because Copernicus, as you know, he had put the sun in the center, and not the Earth. And it's only when you put the Sun in the center that the Venus, which is in between us and the Sun, can have phases. And so it's thanks to Galileo that Copernicus um, was proven right. Copernicus had drawn this model based not on astronomical observations, but based on... It just looked simpler to him, it looked more logical. Um, and so that's what, that's, that's what happened. This didn't work very well, right? I mean, Copernicus used circles. We all know that the planets are ellipses, so it was only approximate. And it was a figure. We had to wait another 100 years before the next revolution. A 100 years later, Newton came on the scene, and Newton retaught Copernicus's system. He said, OK, there's going to be some underlying mathematics, some underlying laws, which are going to explain how this whole solar system hangs together. Now, Newton was a strange character, right? A little bit of a sort of a, not an easy going boy. But he was a brilliant mathematician, so brilliant that he invented calculus. And once he had invented calculus, he began to think about gravity in a completely new way. Everything which comes before Newton, we as, as, as scientists, it feels very strange to us today. 
It's, it's almost like poetry, even the Greeks. Everything which comes after Newton, to us scientists, feels completely familiar. The way he does laws and physics is just like we, we, we do it today. And so he came up with the formula, which you all remember from high school, right? There's the left side and the right side, and there's this equality. Uh, and so he came up with this force, the force of gravity, and the force of gravity on the left is proportional to the mass of the objects, m1 and m2, and it's weaker if the distance grows, eh? the distance r between those objects. And so that was a completely new thing, because this formula you can use to predict stuff and to find the way how things uh, move through space. Perhaps the biggest, um, how do you say this, sort of the supreme moment of Newton's physics, uh, sort of, yeah, the highlight, probably came in the, in the, in the mid-19th century, so about 150 years ago. Uh, at that time, um, so people knew about Uranus, the planet Uranus, but the planet Uranus, the orbit of the planet Uranus was not quite following Newton's law. And so people thought, hmm, it's fizzy. But then there was the French guy, the Frenchman, Le Verrier, Urbain Le Verrier, and he thought, wait a minute, perhaps Newton is right. Perhaps there is another planet further out still, which we don't know, but which pulls a little bit on Uranus and which sort of makes the orbit of Uranus deviate a little bit from what we expect. That was a clever, clever, clever thought. So the guy took Newton's law, went to his desk, started calculating the whole night long, and he deduced on the basis of this equation where that planet should be if Newton's law was correct, in order to explain the orbit of Uranus. And so then, he said, haha, I'm gonna call, no, well, not call, write, I'm gonna write my friend with a telescope in Berlin, and I'm gonna tell him where to look. So his friend gets this letter, and he turns his telescope exactly to the point in the sky that Le Verrier had pointed him to, and what did he see? He saw Neptune. So that was the discovery of Neptune. And that was an amazing moment in the history of science. Whatever you think of the French, they... <laughs> you know, seriously, they discovered the planet just by calculating, which is truly amazing. You can, know, you, you can use Newton's law without doing any observations. It just flows from the mathematics. And so that, those kind of events in the 19th century made people think that Newton, Newton's laws, were, that his big book, the Principia, was, was the new Bible. Newton's laws were beginning to be regarded as the new absolute uh, truths, right? Um, well, I guess you, you might not have read the Principia. In case you have not read the Principia, let me tell you something about the introduction. The thing with the gravity, which I told you, is the second part of the Principia. Seriously. It's the first part. And the first part is about something even more basic. It's super interesting. It's about space and time. You see, in order to write down Newton's law, as you did casually in high school, you used notions of space and notions of time. Because if you don't have a notion of distance and uh, time intervals, then you can't really tell how stuff moves through space in the course of time, of course. And so Newton realized this. And he said, OK, I need to define space and time, otherwise eh, I cannot go. And so he defined space. 
he defined space to be um, a stage, a theater, like this. Unmoving, unchanging, just a rigid space which is there. And he defined the time like a river, a river which flows, a clock which ticks regularly from the infinite past to the infinite future. And within that metaphysical backdrop, he did his physics. Everything plays out. He had a sort of a structure of absolutes, and then physics was happening um, within. So that's basically Newton's worldview, what you see here. Just some stage, and I should shut up. But there is something really strange, and Newton, Newton knew it. There's something really strange about this scheme. With that stage, and the sun, and the earth, and the planets, how the hell, how the hell does the earth know that a few hundred million miles away, there's the sun? And hence, it got to turn. There's something truly bizarre about the way Newton thought about gravity. It just was, in a way, magical. How, of, of, how there could be some mysterious force acting across millions and millions of miles of void, and yet do its thing. And so, as I said, Newton knew it. And he... Um, wrote in his Principia, he wrote, well, yeah, it's weird. But I have left that question to the consideration of my reader. <laughs> That's what he wrote. So it's a very good ending of a book. You should remember, if ever you write a book, I think it's a brilliant ending. But you know what happened? 200 years later, this guy reads the Principia. And he also says, gee, that's a strong question. I'm going to think about it. And so he thought about it. He thought about it 10 years. In fact, it's a period which he describes as um, something like a lonely journey through the desert, not knowing where you'd end up, something like that. That's, that's his memory of these 10 years. But after 10 years, after 10 years of hard thinking, Einstein gave the most amazing answer to Newton's uh, question which he posed 200 years earlier. And I'm, I want to take you to Einstein's answer now. Here it comes. Of course, Einstein always also uses mathematics, and as you can see, the man writes down a different equation. There it is. Now, this is a little more abstract. Not so many people see this in high school. But it reads equally easy. Really, it reads super easy. I'm going to read it for you in words. What is happening here is that on the left-hand side, there's an object which resembles or which delineates the shape of space. And on the right-hand side, there's an object which tells you how much matter and energy and stuff is in that space. And the magic of this Einstein equation is the equality sign in the middle. Einstein tells you that the shape of space is determined by the matter which is in that space. And so it's that relation, that correspondency, that's what we call gravity, Einstein says. So if you take the, the Earth, then the mass of the Earth, according to Einstein, will deform the shape of space, will slightly deform it. And that slight curvature is enough to keep us with our feet on the ground, we are sort of sliding down that little valley, and to keep the Moon in orbit around the Earth. If you make the mass heavier and heavier, and if you put more stuff in it, what is going to happen? the valley in space is going to deepen. And if you exaggerate, you're going to get this. You're going to get a huge throat in the fabric of space, in the shape of space, which is going to um, 
confine everything which falls into that. That trod, that shape of space, is what we've all seen on the sky. It's a black hole. The black disk in the middle is a region of space where the warping is so large that light gets trapped in a throat, and that's why it can't escape. If you want to really know where that black hole is, later when you walk out, you should look in the direction of the Virgo cluster. But you should bring with you a very good telescope, right? Because they zoomed in, they zoomed in. In fact, to make that picture of a black hole, uh, my colleagues hooked up eight telescopes across the globe to sort of create a virtual disk as large as our planet, and that's what gave them the resolution to ultimately zoom in on the center, the very center of that biggest galaxy in the Virgo cluster, where eventually they found this. It's a true, a true expedition, if you wish. And so, Einstein's answer to Newton's question, how does gravity work, is truly amazing. Einstein's answer is, it is the shape of space itself which mediates what we call the gravitational force. It is no longer a mystery. What Einstein is doing, so what the, the, the beauty of Einstein's theory, or the beauty of Einstein's discovery, is that he didn't just sort of tweak a little bit the second part of the Principia of Newton, no! He changed the first part. He changed the very worldview on which the second part of the Principia was based. And that is sort of evoked here a little bit um, in this artwork. This is, oops, gravity. Uh, here you see, I know you don't quite see it because of these strange shapes here, but there is a portrait of Newton being brought to the fire well, while Einstein's curved space is sort of emerging um, on the right-hand side there. This is perhaps the most vivid way of illustrating that Einstein really made space and time come alive. You take two black holes that will create ripples of waves of space, and if you happen to be in the wake of those waves, well, you get stretched and squeezed. And those are waves of gravity, those are gravitational waves which we've been observing for a few years. So here we are. We have this new way of thinking with Einstein about gravity, which sort of brings this metaphysical arena of Newton into science, into physics. And so the biggest implication of this was that it gives you a scientific framework to begin to think about these age-old questions, the same questions that the South African creation myth and these thinkers of Hamangia were thinking about. Like, what is this whole universe about? Now Einstein had an equation. He had an equation which potentially could provide an answer to this. And he realized this, although he didn't seem too happy about it, but he did try to a friend of his, I want to determine the shape of the universe as a whole. And the significance of that sentence is that Einstein realized, damn, this equation is just, it's just about everything. But then something very strange happened. So, of course, Einstein tried and he got some strange answers. So, and he didn't accept these answers. So Einstein looked for the very first time at sort of what we call now modern cosmology, the, the science of the universe as a whole. He looked at his equation, and he just didn't like it. And he didn't accept it. He, he rejected his own theory. The real discovery of the cosmology that flows out of, of the theory of the universe, that flows out of Einstein's equation, at least in Belgium, we say it's discovered by this Belgian. Uh, it's, this is Georges Lemaitre, 
who was an astronomer and a priest, and he, uh, he was, this was the next generation after Einstein, and he sort of looked, maybe because he was a priest, he looked with, with an open mind at, at Einstein's equation. And so what he did, well, there is the equation again, you remember it, right? He took all the matter in the universe, put it on the left-hand side, walked over to the right-hand side of the equation, no, all the way around, right, for you guys, um, and then deduced that if you look at the universe as a whole, it must be expanding. The universe standing still, like Newton would have it, simply does not exist in Einstein's theory. The universe cannot be static. And of course, um, that, was a, that was a major discovery. And how you, how you see that, if you follow the expansion toward, through, through time, of course, how you see that is that the galaxies move away from, from each other, right? Um, and the most amazing thing, of course, is that if you were to run the universe backwards in time, yeah, if you go to the past, then obviously at some point, the galaxies must all have been on top of each other. And so that moment in the past became known as the Big Bang. The Big Bang was not an explosion. The Big Bang was a moment in the past where space itself was shrinking. And because space is mixed up with time in Einstein's theory, time and space come to an end, come to a violent end, which we which we, know, which we know in physics uh, as a singularity. So, there we had it, the birth of the Big Bang universe. Now, what do you do when you discover the Big Bang? Lemaitre couldn't tell his wife, and so he wrote a poem about it. And it's kind of a nice poem. Uh, especially the last two lines, Right? Uh, the Big Bang is the first instant at the bottom of space-time, the now which has no yesterday, because yesterday there was no space. This quote by Lemaitre was written in 1932. So back then, it was already very clear to Lemaitre that this whole theory of Einstein implied that not so long ago, 13 billion years ago, three times the age of the Earth, that at that moment, the universe, the entire universe, was just completely different from anything we can imagine. It's a really shocking discovery. He thought about it a little bit as he didn't use the word Big Bang, uh, that came much later. Lemaitre's word for the origin was something like a primeval atom. But an atom in sort of the ancient Greek kind of thing, right? As a sort of an abstract, undividable, non-structured non object, which then, in his case, didn't even exist in space and time. So extremely difficult uh, to imagine. And so, as you can imagine, not everyone was on board with this business, right? Let's be clear. Uh, some thought that Lemaitre was being, had a hidden religious agenda. Others thought that speculation about 13 billion years ago is just insane. And so, the drama of Lemaitre's life was a bit that he had this beautiful Big Bang theory, and no one believed him. Until a year before he died. A year before Lemaitre died, in the mid-1960s, this happened. Two engineers, Penzias and Wilson, at Bell Labs, Bell Labs, from the Bell Telephone Labs, in New Jersey, they were playing around with these huge antennas, these huge radio antennas, which were being used for um, radio, intercontinental radio communication. And where they, those guys uh, noticed that wherever they were turning their radio antenna, they were hearing some noise. This is what they wrote. Wherever we look, 
we hear a faint noise at a, tem- a source of radiation. And the temperature of that radiation was 3 Kelvin. So minus 270 degrees Celsius. And of course, they were engineers. So they thought about this as noise, annoying noise. But soon it became clear that this radiation was there day and night, wherever they looked. It was constant. It had the same temperature everywhere. And soon it became clear that these guys had found the leftover, the cold remnant radiation of what was once the hot Big Bang. You see, when the universe was very small, it must have been very hot. That radiation cannot escape because it fills the entire space. The only thing which can happen if the universe expands is that the radiation cools, but it can't go, it can't go away. And so this tree Kelvin is the very cold remnant after 13 billion years of expansion of what was once a very hot universe. This is how it looks, that radiation. This is a a sky map. It's a map of the entire sky projected. And the map shows not the stars, not the galaxies. It shows the universe behind the first stars and the galaxies. It shows the temperature of that primeval Big Bang radiation. And the difference between the colors indicate the different temperatures. And the difference between the blue and the green is not much, it's not more than 0.00001 degree. So what this map is showing is that the hot Big Bang, sort of a snapshot of the hot Big Bang. And the map shows that the hot Big Bang was not exactly equally hot everywhere. It had these very slight, slight, slight cold and hot patches. Now you might say, okay, okay, fine, fine. I mean, all these details. Look what happened. Because there were these hot and and cold patches, when the universe evolved and expanded, the slightly hotter regions began to clump. And it is where they were clumping that eventually, after a few hundred million years, stars and galaxies were born. And those stars and galaxies organized themselves into bigger galaxies, bigger structures, and eventually the universe became in a more uh, calmer period with planets, planets like the Earth, and ultimately the satellite with which we can map out this whole evolution. That's the history of the universe in one minute. (laughs) Yeah, because I don't get much time here, right, because of this. So good, this is it. We can move to the dance performance. Except I'm going to leave you with a question. I want to leave you with a question as difficult as the one which Newton posed in his uh, Principia, right? And the question has to do with this evolution. If you've listened carefully, then you've realized that if the Big Bang did not have these slight hot and cold uh, patches, nothing would have happened. And I can assure you that if these hot and cold patches, patches had been a little hotter and colder, if the difference had been just a tiny bit larger, that evolution that I just told you would yield a universe full of black holes, but without galaxies, without stars, and without life. So, there was something extremely, extremely special about the Big Bang. And the question I want to leave you with is, the universe looks like a fix, a big fix, why? That is the central question of the level of difficulty um, of the one Newton post, and of certainly of the level of confusion for the current generation of cosmologists. It's the question, this is another example of, of, of this mysterious, bio-friendly features 
of the Big Bang, these features of the Big Bang, which billions of years later yield a universe full of life. This is a number which you need, uh, which if it, hadn't be, if, if it had been a little bit different, it wouldn't have worked, the evolution of the universe. So the question is then, yeah, okay, why do we need all these zeros? Huh? Um, and so that was, some people say, aha, I know the answer. We, there is not just one universe, there are many universes. There's a multiverse of all kinds of different Big Bangs and all kinds of local laws and physics and signs and cocktails there and no signs and cocktails over there and all that stuff. If you're going to go down that route, you're in serious trouble. Because in such a multiverse, you don't know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, you cannot predict anything, and it's the end of your, of your science. And so when I met uh, Hawking 20 years ago, that was the kind of question, the kind of question he was thinking about. He thought that this mysterious bio-friendliness of the Big Bang is telling us something deep, something which we don't understand about the very roots of the laws of cosmology or the laws of physics. And so he got really hooked on that question and he drew me in it and we only emerged, yeah, we were not as smart as Einstein, so we only emerged 20 years later with some sort of vague uh, answer, right? And the key point about this question is the following, the deepest point, stay with me. Deepest point is the fact that the laws of physics, as Newton and Einstein conceived them, have absolutely are, are objective truths, are impersonal, have nothing to do with life. We, as life or as observers or as participants in the universe, do not appear in these laws. And so there is nothing which can be bio-friendly about the Big Bang if it is governed by such objective and impersonal laws. Somehow, in a very subtle way, we got to change our perspective. We have to start thinking about cosmology, start developing a new kind of physics which looks at the universe, which studies the universe, which describes the universe, universe from the inside out and not from the outside in, like the rest of physics uh, is doing. And the way to sneak the observer in, the way to sneak that perspective in, has a lot to do with the combination of the laws of gravity and space and time and the quantum theory of particles, the microscopic world. Because the quantum theory of particles does have that subtle effect that the observer or the questions that you ask kind of influence how reality uh, manifests itself. And so what we, what we did with Stephen was we developed what we called a quantum cosmology, a cosmology of the large universe, but based fundamentally on the principles of quantum theory, which allowed us to take that different perspective. And if you then go back to the Big Bang, if you go then back to the beginning of time, you see that the dimension of time doesn't sort of hit the singularity, but gradually fades away. And if you zoom in on that primeval era, what you discover is amazing. You discover a sort of primitive version of what I would call a Darwinian process. A Darwinian process of variation and selection, but playing out at the level of the physical laws. There's sort of a tree of laws which diversifies gradually, which is a probabilistic process, where the different forces we know gradually shape and the particles and the dimensions sort of take shape. And that, that it's an ancient evolution. Since then, since the first few seconds, this business is frozen. That level of evolution is fixed. And so we've been thinking about it as eternal and absolute. But in fact, it's just as evolutionary as the rest of the, tre the tree of life and all that. And if you take that tree all the way down, all the way down to the beginning, the very last transition 
is a transition in which also the dimension of time fades away and becomes kind of a space dimension and closes off the universe. But that transition is not just the origin of time, it is the origin of the laws themselves. And that's the crucial difference in perspective. So you might say, well, I'm disappointed. Because it means what I've just been telling you sort of means that we have no ultimate foundation, not even in physics, that we have to get used to the fact that also the fundamental laws of physics have, in one way or another, an emergent aspect to them. And so I asked Hawking at the end of his life how he thought about it, because it was a huge change of perspective, perspective also for him. He started out thinking like Einstein, I'm going to find the theory of everything, everything. And he sort of changed all the way to a much more Darwinian perspective. And he said that he kind of liked it. Because in the absence of an end point, in the absence of what you could call a theory of everything or an absolute truth, he said there's always going to be room for discovery and creativity and exploration. And maybe that's more important. Thank you. <laughs>